Welcome to Module 5 of Sensation and Perception Online. This presentation will cover the basics of sound, the range of human hearing, and the anatomy and physiology of the auditory system. What is sound? An energy? A wave? Yes, it's both of those things. But what is the energy? And a wave of what? Before we answer that, let's first take a step back. Atmospheric air pressure is fairly stable. Yes, it changes, but it does so relatively slowly. So the dashed line in the figure shows air pressure as stable. Sounds are created when objects, like a speaker, vibrate. The speaker diaphragm pushes and pulls forcing air molecules to compress then expand. The compression and expansion dissipates through the air as a wave. Compressing air molecules together produces higher pressure and dispersing air molecules produces lower pressure. This change in air pressure is sound. Here you can see the process in action though much slower than it occurs in real life. The red bar represents a speaker diaphragm pushing and pulling. The black dots represent air molecules, with a few of them highlighted in red so that you can follow them more easily. Notice the air molecules are not shot out like bullets or blown away as would a fan. Instead, the air molecules move around the same area. The only thing, the only thing that moves is the wave of compressions and expansions. These waves are measured in several ways. The amplitude is the magnitude or amount of pressure change. The wavelength is the distance of one complete cycle, shown here as being measured from peak to peak. The frequency is the number of times per second one complete wave cycle passes a point in space. Longer wavelengths have lower frequencies. The human auditory system is sensitive to an incredibly wide array of sounds. We can consider range along two dimensions, amplitude and frequency. For amplitude, the range of faintest to loudest sounds that we can hear and that don't cause damage to our ears is a ratio of one to one million. For frequency, the range is also very wide, from about 20 hertz, that is 20 cycles per second or 20 wavelengths per second, to about 20,000 hertz. There are a few things to note. Threshold refers to the absolute threshold of hearing, that is the lowest intensity sound that can be heard at that frequency. As you can see, the threshold changes across frequency. Low frequency bass tones require a higher amplitude to be heard, which is why there is a market for subwoofers and amplifiers. The pain threshold also changes across frequency. Higher frequencies produce pain at lesser intensities than lower frequencies do. Lastly, in the lower figure, you can see the normal amplitude and frequency ranges for speech and music. Notice the frequency range of speech is very wide. We'll now begin our overview of the auditory system. The pinna is the part of the ear that we see and serves to funnel sound into the ear canal. The length and shape of the ear canal enhances some sound frequencies, helping us hear them better. It also protects the delicate inner structures. One of these inner structures is the tympanic membrane, or eardrum. This is a thin sheet of skin at the end of the ear canal. It is the division between the outer and middle ear. It forms a complete seal across the ear canal. Under normal conditions, the pressure on the outside is equal to the pressure on the inside. The eustachian tube which connects the middle ear to the throat, allows the pressure to equalize. 
If your ears have ever been plugged when diving, driving into the mountains, flying, or when sick, it is because the pressure outside the ear was different from the pressure inside. Popping your ears by yawning or chewing gum is opening the eustachia tube and allowing the pressure to equalize. It is important that the pressure be equal. The tympanic membrane moves in and out with changes of air pressure. If the pressure on the inside is different from the pressure on the outside, then the tympanic membrane is strained and is less free to move. Fact or fiction? Puncturing the eardrum will leave a person deaf. Fiction. Despite being incredibly painful, says the man knowingly, in most cases the eardrum will heal, heal itself. Next, we'll focus on the middle ear, the section highlighted in the figure. The middle ear consists of three ossicles, or tiny bones, and two muscles. The three bones are the malus, incus, and stapes. The malus is connected to the tympanic membrane. So when the tympanic membrane is pushed in and out, the malus moves with it. The incus join, joints with the malus and the stapes. The stapes is connected to the oval window of the cochlea. As the stapes is pushed and pulled by the lever action of the malus and incus, it pushes and pulls on the oval window of the cochlea. The two muscles are the tensor tympani and the stapedius muscles. When loud sound is heard, that is, when the tympanic membrane moves a lot, these muscles contract, reducing the amount of movement of the ossicles. This protective action, however, does not work for sudden loud sounds like gunshots, since the shot is heard before the reflex could react. This brings us to the inner ear. The cochlea is a tiny coiled structure which contains three can canals that run side by side. Each canal is filled with fluid. The vestibular canal runs from the oval window to the tip of the cochlea. The middle canal runs alongside the vestibular canal and contains the cochlear partition. Reisner's membrane separates these two canals. It is, a thin, it is thin and pliable. The tympanic canal runs from the tip of the cochlea back to the round window so back to the base of the cochlea. The cochlear partition is where sound transduction actually takes place and is what we will take a closer look at next. The cochlear partition is an intricate and delicate piece of biological equipment. We will just focus on the main parts. First, the basilar membrane is a stiff and fibrous plate that supports the partition. Next, the tectorial membrane, shown in purple, is a soft flap. One end is attached to Reisner's membrane, the pliable membrane separating the vestibular and middle canals. The other end rests on top of stereocilia. In fact, the stereocilia are actually embedded into the tectorial membrane. Finally, we have the inner hair cells. These are the transducers of sound. They are mechanoreceptors, meaning they respond when they are physically moved. Although there are both inner and outer hair cells, only the inner hair cells transduce sound. Now let's take a very deep breath and walk through how all of these parts work together to turn sound waves into auditory sensation. Waves of fluctuating air pressure are transmitted down the ear canal 
to the tympanic membrane. It moves in and out with the changing pressure, pushing and pulling on the ossicles, the three tiny bones called the malus, incus, and stapes. The stapes pushes and pulls on the oval window of the cochlea. As the oval window is pushed and pulled, it sends waves of pressure through the fluid of the vestibular canal. These waves move through fluid similarly to the way we've described them moving through air. One important difference here, though, is that the cochlea is a sealed system, and the vestibular canal is a tiny tube. Reisner's membrane is the only section of the vestibular canal that can fluctuate with these pressure changes. So, as pressure waves run down the vestibular canal, Reisner's membrane moves in and, in and out. As it moves, the tectorial membrane, which is attached to Reisner's membrane, also moves. When the tectorial membrane moves, it shears back and forth across the cilia, bending them. As the stereocilia are bent, the hair cells fire, and that is the extremely simple process of sound wave transduction. But that still doesn't explain how the qualities of sound are encoded, how is amplitude turned into loudness, and how is frequency turned into pitch. Let's start with amplitude. Higher amplitudes cause the tectorial membrane to move farther back and forth across the stereocilia. The more the stereocilia are moved, the more the hair cells fire. More firing is perceived as a louder sound. Frequency is encoded in a different way. Different areas of the cochlea have hair cells that are tuned to different frequencies. So the frequency of a sound is coded by the place along the cochlear partition with the greatest activation. The figure represents the cochlea uncoiled so that we can see it. We see that a 25 hertz tone, a bass tone, displaces the cochlear partition maximally at about 32 millimeters from the oval window. That is, it, it's displaced maximally near the cochlear apex. As the sound frequency increases, maximal displacement occurs closer and closer to the cochlear base. So, high pitches are encoded by hair cells near the base of the cochlea, whereas low bass tones are encoded by hair cells near the cochlear apex. Here is an animation of the place code uh, theory. Zoom down the ear canal, see the tympanic membrane moving, uncoil the cochlea, and reveal the inner structure. Lower tones near the apex, higher tones near the base. To review, sound energy is the compression and expansion of air molecules. Humans are able to hear a wide range of sound amplitudes and sound frequencies. The auditory system involves a lot of moving parts, literally. It comes down to a gelatinous flap moving back and forth across tiny hair cells. Amplitude, or loudness, 
is encoded by how far the flap moves back and forth, and frequency, or pitch, is encoded by where, along the cochlear partition, the flap moves the most. That brings us to the end of this presentation. Now that is music to my ears.